In this video, we'll go into detail how an SMPS, or switched mode power supply, works on a control board. We'll talk about how the input filter works, initial rectification or conversion of AC into DC voltage, the switching circuit, high frequency transformer and galvanic isolation, feedback control circuit, and output rectification and filter. We'll also discuss how some of these functional areas can fail, as well as what voltage references to use when troubleshooting. So stick around for that last part because that's pretty interesting. This is where line voltage connects to the board. After passing through the fuse, L1 has a capacitor in parallel with neutral. This capacitor resists rapid changes in voltage, which reduces high frequency noise. Also, after passing through this surge resistor, more about this in a minute, neutral and L1 are in parallel with this MOV, or metal oxide varistor. This device has almost infinite resistance below a certain voltage, but approaches zero ohms above a threshold, such as 400 volts, such as in the case of a voltage surge caused by nearby lightning. Consequently, high current flows through the MOV, taking out the fuse. Next is the EMI filter, which includes a common mode choke and additional capacitors. The common mode choke functions as a specialized dual inductor that resists high frequency current spikes originating from the power supply and are present on both lines. Its purpose is to prevent such noise, which occurs on both lines, from entering the house supply. Simultaneously, it allows the low frequency cycling current of the 60 Hz sine wave to pass through without hindrance because the normal current that flows in a circle is largely ignored by the behavior of this special type of inductor. Next, the line voltage AC is rectified by a bridge rectifier composed of four diodes. This transforms the AC waveform into a full wave rectified waveform, as shown here. This signal, representing the 170 volt peak value of 120 volt sine wave, charges capacitors to approximately 170 volts DC. Initially, when you plug in the refrigerator, the capacitors try to charge instantaneously. Since by their nature capacitors resist changes in voltage, they respond to this by drawing a huge amount of current. In fact, during the initial power on, the current surge can be upwards of 50 amps. However, to protect the fuse from blowing due to this current spike, a low value, high wattage resistor is employed. This resistor, in combination with the acceptable ESR, or equivalent series resistance, of the capacitors, effectively absorbs the energy by inducing a temporary voltage drop. Remember that voltage equals resistance times current. As a result, the fuse is protected from blowing when you plug in the refrigerator and initially charge the capacitors. Potential failures in this circuit block include diodes shorting out and blowing the fuse after a voltage surge. Additionally, the capacitors may develop a high equivalent series resistance, or ESR, causing them to be ineffective in filtering out the AC ripple of the rectified signal. As a result, the power output from the power supply could be reduced. Symptoms of such issue may include the power supply struggling to meet demands, a flashing display on the interface board, or a cyclical clunking noise. This component acts as the power supply switching element, operating in series with the primary of the transformer at high frequency. It is prone to failure, especially during voltage surges. Its purpose is to convert the DC stored in the capacitors into an AC voltage across the primary of the transformer. Consequently, an AC voltage appears across the secondary, which is much lower than that of the primary, in order to meet the system's low voltage requirements. The secondary side of the transformer is isolated from the primary side because there is no direct connection between the two windings. This prevents a direct path for the current flow between the two transformer sides. This principle is known as galvanic isolation. The AC voltage on the secondary is rectified by a single diode here, resulting in a 13 volt DC value stored across the capacitors. SMPS, or switch mode power supplies, require feedback from the secondary to the primary side so that the output voltage can be regulated. Feedback is provided by an opto isolator, which maintains isolation between the two sides using an LED and a photosensor. The presence of the internal LED light directly correlates with the voltage on the secondary. As the secondary's voltage increases, the optocoupler's LED turns on, telling the primary side that the secondary has reached its target voltage. Consequently, a PWM or pulse width modulation signal 
decreases the duty cycle of the switching element, so the less voltage is induced across the transformer's primary and correspondingly across its secondary. Conversely, when the LED turns off, the PWM duty cycle increases, ultimately increasing the voltage induced across the transformer's secondary. In this way, with the help of the optolator, the power supply maintains a regulated 13 volt DC output on its secondary. This 13 volt DC powers the display board, relays, fans, and other components operating at 12 to 13 volts. This common 7805 regulator, the 5, meaning 5 volts, further reduces the 13 volts to 5 volts DC, supplying power to the microcontroller and other 5 volt dependent circuits. This power supply operates continuously to maintain constant power to the microcontroller. On the secondary side of the switch mode power supply, a common failure can occur with the filter capacitors. Due to the high operating frequency, which is greater than 10 kHz, these capacitors can be physically small yet still be required to handle substantial current. This leads to power dissipation issues, excess heat, and evaporation of electrolyte, resulting in high equivalent series resistance. Symptoms of this may resemble those of the primary side capacitor failure, with the power supply struggling to meet demands. Additionally, the resulting high frequency ripple on the secondary can introduce noise and DC loads. It is important to note that in this model, the DC, or low voltage ground, is not connected to the chassis or earth ground. So when troubleshooting or measuring voltages on the low voltage side, you would use board ground rather than chassis ground. Not all boards are floating like this. Some power supply grounds are bonded to the chassis. However, in these cases, any current flowing out of the DC supply will only flow through the chassis in an attempt to return to its source, which is the low voltage power supply. Also note that when measuring voltages on the primary side of the power supply, you will reference neutral until the voltage is rectified, that is, once rectified, a virtual ground is created by the bridge rectifier. That virtual ground would be the basis for DC voltage measurements on the primary side of the power supply. Note that you will never want to use the low Z mode of a voltmeter when measuring voltages in this section of the power supply primary. Because the delicate balance of the SMPS power supply's operation can be severely impacted by the relatively low impedance of the meter. While this board features a switch mode power supply SMPS, many boards employ a simpler linear power supply that still provides isolation between the primary and low voltage secondary sides. Linear supplies are less complex, that is they need no feedback, have less components, and run at a much lower frequency, but they are less efficient. For a detailed explanation of different control board power supply types, please refer to video number eight, control board power supplies. That's it for this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel.